We have just received word from the National Weather Service that a spotter has reported a funnel cloud approaching Panama and radar from the National Weather Service in Tulsa indicates that a possible tornado is beginning to form there. So again, if you live in and around the area of Panama, possibly across the area of Spiro, again, you would sh you need to be taking cover at the present time. Re-updating the situation again right now, what you're looking at is a zoom in on Fort Smith. These storms are approaching the area. I can hear the thunder through the walls right now. And again, this thunderstorm is packing another wall up here, folks. 60 to 70 mile per hour wind gusts are possible. Large hail, frequent deadly lightning is possible with this thing as well. These things are apparently fairly well supercharged with electricity. And this is not a storm to be messing around with, quite like the one it has before. And also, unfortunately, there is a possibility that these next upcoming storms could also contain tornadoes. So, but again, not a time for panic. This is a time for clear thinking. If you live in and around the area, you need to know where to go to. And again, uh, how to protect yourself and your family should it become necessary. We've had reports of several funnel clouds forming around the area, as well as reports of around 60 to 70 mile per hour wind gusts. So wind damage is a distinct possibility. If you are just joining us, we are live right now broadcasting as best as we can from uh, downtown TV5 in Fort Smith. The power is out all over the place right now, and TV5 is on emergency backup generators. We are apparently are the only TV sta or radio station, from what we understand right now, that is still on the air. So we'll try to stay on for as long as possible and try to keep as much information flowing. Five viewing area all through the night and into the wee hours of this morning. Good morning and thanks for joining us on this Monday, April 22nd. I'm Elizabeth Woolsey. Now folks all around Oklahoma are faced with cleaning up. One area hit especially hard was the downtown Fort Smith area along Garrison Avenue. A tornado that ripped through Fort Smith actually hit through this area just a few blocks away through the Garrison Avenue area and the north side of town. Anything north of, of Rogers Avenue uh, and 10th Street and west of that area from uh, 10th Street and Midland up to the Midland Boulevard Bridge is going to be closed. Uh, all the schools are closed. All the businesses were requesting that they stay home. The major factories have already closed, but if you own a small business, we want you to just stay home today and not come in. We just can't accommodate you. Most of the streets are impassable. There are live electric lines down. Gas leaks are uh, uh, rampant. Uh, and so we've had quite a problem. We know that two children were killed in the 2700 block of High Avenue in Fort Smith. Residents in the area say many of the houses in that area were either leveled or heavily damaged. And like most of the TV5 viewing area, power lines were knocked down. Now neighbors are faced with the massive cleanup. Northwest Arkansas did not escape Mother Nature's wrath. Funnel clouds were reported touching down in several parts of Madison County. Tim Brucker paid a visit to one of the area's hardest hit. I should say the Madison County Sheriff's Office says they had reports of a tornado touching down in several parts of the county. The only injuries reported thus far were residents of a mobile home on Venus Mountain Road outside of Aurora. You get a look at it there. Five people, two adults and three children were taken from the scene to Washington Regional Medical Center. At this point, their condition has not been released. As you can see by what is left of the mobile home, it is amazing that anyone made it out of there alive. When those storms moved through Muldrow, motorists and residents there took refuge under an overpass of Interstate 40. A LaFleur County EMS crew was passing through and helped these people weather the storm. And in Stigler, TV5 weather watcher Lonnie Tate tells us electricity was knocked out with the first round of storms. Good morning, everyone. It, it has been a terrible night for people in the Oklahoma viewing area. Tornadoes, as you know, have ripped across the area. Two children are dead in Fort Smith. Forty-two people at least confirmed uh, injured. Uh, most of those have been taken to hospitals. Most of them are non-serious. Austin Onik has been up throughout the uh, evening, all night long. Uh, what happened, Austin? This is a tremendous storm system that developed. This was a uh, classic springtime storm that just went uh, completely and totally bonkers. We've seen now what you see on the uh, screen right now is some of the uh, storm systems that we tracked through the area last night. And this thing could have skipped at times, and we think this probably was actually one of possibly two tornadoes that came down across the area, went straight on up almost just parallel to Midland Boulevard, crossed the river, and then hit parts of Van Buren. And then I looked out my back window and I could see it coming like from Fort Smith and it was just right over us and I ran out my front door and you could see it on the ground dropping stuff blowing up boom boom and 
They did not get any warning from the siren. The only thing that probably saved their lives is the last thing that Austin said on TV last night for them to prepare to take cover, that there was a tornado headed toward Van Buren. At the time the tornado hit, I was on the fourth floor in the garrison building. Oh, and, you, were you trapped? Uh, just yeah, temporarily I was trapped. Uh, what I can say, judging from the sound, was that the, the tornado definitely took a eastward direction. Uh, I'm, I'm confident that the garrison building was the first building hit. And after I was trapped underneath the desk, after the debris sealed me up, I could just hear the destruction then going on down the street. When it hit, um, we didn't see what it hit, but you could see all the debris and, and uh, light shooting up through the tornado. It was a teal green color. It was the most amazing sight we've ever seen. The skies were flashing purple, pink. It, it was just beautiful color. But you could hear it. There was silence before it hit. Um, just everything that we always heard about tornadoes. We were on B Street about, uh, I'd say we just crossed over 5th. And all of a sudden there were walls down, buildings uh, demolished, uh, uh, beams of wood with nails sticking out of them all over the place, power lines down into the street. We've been on Garrison Avenue all day long talking about the effect effects of the storm on Garrison Avenue, but a lot of businesses on the north side of town were heavily damaged during the storm. If we can take a look at the video that we have for you, we'll show you all the dam, uh, especially one place that really received some damage. Numerous businesses were heavily damaged, including the Fort Smith Lumber Company. The company has been in Fort Smith for 12 years on North 2nd Street, but nothing could prepare them for the fury of last night's storm. It is. We spent a lot of time and hours down here trying to build up this business. and. Uh, and for it to uh, disappear so quickly, it's kind of hard to swallow. The north side area is just in devastation as well as ruined. I mean, we drove by house after house of trees being uprooted, uh, power lines down. And also we drove along Midland Avenue and there were signs down, a Burger King sign down, restaurant signs down. So the north side of town really took its beating. It blew the south side of the windows, all of them out, and the wind was just coming straight through the house and blew the north side walls off. I'm calling from Fort Smith and uh, I went to Van Buren this morning to get my daughter and my granddaughter from the Reno Road area mm -hmm. and that Cedar Creek area and that apartment complex is nearly totally destroyed wow. and all of those homes are nearly totally destroyed and it is it looks like an atomic bomb has hit. They did not get any warnings from the sirens the only thing that probably saved their lives is the last thing that Austin said on TV last night for them to prepare to take cover, that there was a tornado headed toward Van Buren. I'm at Rhonda Wheeler's house. We talked to her about uh, half an hour ago. This was her master bedroom right here. She was asleep at about, went to bed around 11 o'clock, and all of a sudden around 11.14 she heard this huge thunder, lightning, something rolling on through, and she was laying in this waterbed right here. All of a sudden, she decided she felt something that she had to get out. She ran over here, out of here, and luckily she did, because as you can see, the entire brick wall that used to stand over her fell right on her bed, would have crushed her, but what she did is she ran through here, grabbed her nephew, grabbed her son, and they huddled in the bathroom and luckily they escaped injury. But just another remarkable story here in Van Buren. Now Elizabeth Woolsey was out here earlier today talking to other folks and found out what they're doing now. In a matter of seconds, nature's fury turned homes into piles of splintered wood and twisted metal. It was, it was the most fear I've ever felt in my life and the only thing I could think about was um, just let me live and I prayed that everything would be all right and it was. So we pulled the mattress over us and the house started shaking and we could feel things float, floating through the air and it was the longest t two minutes of my life. We still have a lot of live power lines down, we have a lot of ruptured gas lines and it's quite dangerous. Families emerged from their hiding places after the storm to find walls no longer separated them from their neighbors, but they still managed to be thankful. I'm still alive. 
Jana Daly's son was on the living room couch when the storm hit, but that's not where he woke up. He was in the living room, and he ended up across the street, is what he told me. In their yard? Yeah, in the yard. The people hit by the storm say they're still in shock today, but there's no time to dwell on the devastation. The rain is forcing homeowners to sift through the rubble to try to salvage what's left of their belongings. Clothes. I had stashed some money in a book, $800, and we found it. Yeah. <laughs> so I was proud of that. My dog. God bless you, hon. We'll, we'll, we'll go help somebody else load up, okay? See you all later. Thank you. The generosity of volunteers who don't even know these victims is one ray of hope shining through the clouds, but it will take months for those hardest hit to put the pieces of their lives back together. In Van Buren, I'm Elizabeth Woolsey, TV5 News. As we all know, the tornado that hit uh, Van Buren first came and hit downtown Fort Smith, where the damage is estimated to be in the millions. Probably not as much as Van Buren, but still in the millions. TV5's Beth Doremus brings us this look at the aftermath. Just one look at this flag tells you something is terribly wrong in downtown Fort Smith. A tornado ripped through Garrison Avenue around 11 last night. Buildings that withstood the test of time gave in to the fury of nature. It's hard to believe that Garrison Avenue will ever be the same. This building was four stories high. Now it's a pile of bricks. Most of the buildings were unoccupied when the storm hit. But in the Garrison building on the fourth floor, a lawyer ducked under his desk when the storm hit. He then dug himself out of the rubble, alive and okay. But the tornado didn't stop on Garrison Avenue. It paved a path north, damaging numerous businesses like the Fort Smith Lumber Company. The company had been through a lot in its 12 years, but nothing like this. It'd be tough thinking about how you're going to start over. It is. We spent a lot of time and hours down here trying to build up this business and, uh, and for it to disappear so quickly, it's kind of hard to swallow. Them. Fort Smith Lumber plans to set up a temporary office and get back to work as soon as possible. But getting things back to normal will take a while. In Fort Smith, I'm Beth Doremus, TV5 News. After the tornado destroyed downtown Fort Smith, it ripped through the north side of town, damaging hundreds of homes and killing two people. Two children died in the storm. TV5's Mark Martin has more. This house is one of hundreds all over the area ripped apart by a tornado. But tragically, in this particular home, a little girl died. Two-year-old Angelica Fleming is one of two Fort Smith children who lost their lives after the deadly storm had its way. Angelica was sleeping in, under that right there. My dad was thrown from the bed, and he he tried to get get her off the bed, and uh, and my niece, and uh, he got my niece off, and then. And then by the time he got to her, the house just collapsed on top of him. There wasn't no warning. I wasn't but too far away from here, and um, we didn't, nobody heard any sirens. Everybody's been complaining because there's been no sirens heard at all. Reeves is a friend of the other child who died, five-year-old Kyle Johnson. He says the boy was killed when the back of this house collapsed on him. The back part of the house, it, this, the house separated, and when it did, it just caught a hold of him. And got him like that. Both children live near the intersection of High Street and North 23rd, and the neighborhoods surrounding that hub were also destroyed. This man says the high winds blew a nearby house's garage into his yard, but despite all the damage, he still had time to make a joke. Somebody's garage decided it liked my property better than the one it was on. I guess the grass is greener on the other side. Nearby Midland Avenue also didn't escape destruction. Signs were blown over and power lines were knocked down. And as crews begin the cleanup process, John Gallagher begins the process of healing. I always told everybody I like tornadoes. I, I admired them. They're quite beautiful, you know. Not this. In Fort Smith, I'm Mark Martin, TV5 News. Two rural Madison County communities are reeling from the destruction of the storm as well. TV5 Steve Voorhees reports that just like in Fort Smith, the tornado left death and devastated families in its path. Tornado first hit Madison County here, south of St. Paul, but the destruction was so complete no one could even report it until daylight came eight hours later. By then it was too late for the only family living in this secluded valley. Their home was blasted into small pieces mixed with the ruins of neighboring buildings. And two people were dead, a father and his 10-year-old son. There was nothing the rescue workers could do. The boy's mother was still alive in the wreckage, and an AIRIVAC helicopter flew her to Northwest Medical Center in Springdale. She is identified as Leah Lackey, and she is now listed in stable condition. She and her family reportedly moved to Madison County only two weeks ago. 
A few miles north and only minutes later, the tornado slammed into the isolated Venus Mountain community. Neo Keck, his wife and three children, had nowhere to hide but their mobile home. The winds lifted the trailer off its foundation and threw it downhill to a dirt road below. This time, someone was able to call for help, and the emergency crews arrived from Huntsville and Fayetteville. The Kecks were rushed to Washington Regional, but amazingly, only two of them were seriously injured. Shannon Keck and her two-year-old daughter, Melissa, are both in the hospital's intensive care unit. The mother in stable condition, the child listed as guarded. They all escaped with their lives, but their home is gone, and the tornado left them with nowhere to go. In Fayetteville, I'm Steve Ories, TV5 News. Well, have you, if you have not seen the aerial pictures of the devastation brought by this tornado, it, it, they, it's, it's just amazing. Were there three tornadoes, two tornadoes, one tornado? What was it? Yes and no. Uh, I think what the answer is, we've got a uh, classic, what's called, meteorologists call a multiple vortex funnel, and uh, it, which is composed, really, it's one tornado, but it drops several funnels which spin around and dance around each other at the same time. This has been reported by people. They saw, you know, like one funnel with two funnels around it or two funnels on the ground. And anyway, you get spotty damage from this, but let's begin here. Let's uh, roll this video. Uh, this video was taken by John Hartung. And uh, first, uh, what we're looking at, of course, this is downtown uh, Fort Smith on Garrison Avenue. And you can see a lot of, uh, make out the roof damage there. And of course, we also had some definite structural damage in terms of collapsed brick walls, which also denotes a high wind speed. Uh, the uh, tornado then took a, a path more or less north or northeastward between uh, Clayton Expressway and 6th Street. And this is, that's Clayton Expressway right on the bottom of the screen there. So what you're doing, you're looking east into North Fort Smith, and uh, you're just seeing this uh, sporadic uh, damage, uh, you know, uh, things that have been thrown off the roofs and just uh, scattered across uh, the grass. Uh, the twister, you can see, just kind of basically made its way up across this industrial area of North Fort Smith. Of course, it also went right through the, some, some of the neighborhoods there earlier. Of course, did a lot of damage there. And as a matter of fact, uh, the school that, uh, what was the school that was? Morrison Elementary yeah. School. Uh, it was at toward the end of Clayton Expressway. Uh, it was damaged. It will not reopen until uh, they have been able to fix it up. It, apparently, it's fairly extensive so that kids who normally go to Morrison Elementary will not be going there anymore. They'll be shipped to a trusty school instead. And as you know, there will be no school tomorrow in Fort Smith anyway. But it looks like the Morrison Elementary School kids will be going to trusty elementary from here on out. And now Look at that. Oh. Yeah, you also saw a stretch of perfectly nice, you know, woods and, and it didn't seem to be touched. So we're getting a skipping pattern here. Then it crosses the Arkansas River, and here are the cliffs, the top of which we're looking at the Mount Vista area, the Skyline Estates, I believe it is. And this is where it really clobbers a bunch of very nice houses. You can see uh, taking roofs off, uh, ripping walls down. Uh, it uh, moves right through this housing area. This is on the, on the top of a cliff overlooking the Arkansas River. Uh, by the way, some of the damage I think that we're seeing here is... Uh, uh, well, it looks like it almost went right along the edge of the cliff, yeah. doesn't it, James? Either that or we're dealing with a very wide vortex uh, that is with, with multiple vortexes in it. In other words, it's a wide funnel here. I think we're getting up to maybe a 500 yards wide. I, I, we, we have a picture we'll show you in a minute here, and you can see the size of this funnel. Uh, by the time it hit Van Buren, look at this. This is when it bears down, it seems. Here you're getting damage that's compatible with uh, winds of about 150 to 200 miles an hour. But notice, it misses the tower. The water tower is still standing. This is, again could be because we're dealing with multiple vortices. The one, uh, it just missed. They, they yeah, missed But everything the tower. around it, it's gone. But they obliterated houses. And uh, we've heard several stories, of course, of someone's home uh, that was uh, left standing with very little damage right next to it. The roof was gone. And uh, look at that, uh, it's incredible. Uh, that later on, of course, uh, some really uh, severe damage. We might be getting to it shortly here, is, uh, is the Rena Road area and the Pointer Trail area, also in Van Buren, uh, where it really had a lot of extensive damage. That appears to be the place where the, the tornado kind of uh, just really hit with a vengeance and okay. really bore down. And this picture, Jay, this is, this is remarkable. Oh, this is, this is the funnel, folks. Uh, if you can make it out, now that's a bolt of lightning that illuminates the background behind the funnel. The funnel is in the center. You can see that little light area off to the right. That's the other side. So we're looking edge to edge. That's a very wide funnel. That's mm. a monster tornado. Uh, we're dealing a 500, uh, I don't know, that's just a rough estimate, 500 yards wide, but uh, uh, that is a mean storm. This is no, what, what is called uh, like an F0, F1 with a small like little, uh, you know, serpentine tornado or something like that. This is a, anyway, this is a major twister, obviously. 
Governor Jim Guy Tucker and FEMA officials were flying over this area today, uh, taking a look at the damage. The governor estimates that it'll cost $250 million alone in Van Buren. This could be the most expensive destruction in Arkansas's history. Now, TV5's Brian Black has been with the people of Van Buren right here for the last couple of days. He joins us now. As the sun rises on Van Buren, it paints a picture of mass destruction. The stillness of the morning is wrestled away by the sounds of cleanup. Rhonda Wheeler is one of the first to return home. All my kids' pictures were in the pool yesterday, the baby pictures. It just looks worse every time I come back. As morning passes into afternoon, more people begin the grueling task of grabbing what wasn't blown away or torn apart by the twister. What do you know? By mid-afternoon, politicians like U.S. Congressman Tim Hutchinson begin their trek into the area best described as a war zone. The likelihood is this is the worst, at least in money terms, worst tornado to ever hit Arkansas, so it's, uh, it's pretty bad. Hutchinson says he will lobby President Clinton hard to declare Van Buren and Fort Smith federal disaster areas. This cracked photograph symbolizes what has happened in Van Buren. Lives have been torn apart, homes have been destroyed, but what really matters, the people, the people have survived, and one day we'll smile again. This is 39 years of our life right here. And my husband told me this morning about 3.30, he says, well, we're going to start over just like when we were first married. I just hope we don't argue as much as we did then. <laughs> you have to laugh a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Besides being very destructive, a tornado can also be very strange. In this home, the twister picked up this porcelain mug, blew it into the wall, where it now sits and reads, God's promises are forever. Despite the incredible devastation, not one person was killed in Van Buren. And that's what's so amazing. No one was killed, Guy. And like that one lady said, they just have to go on and rebuild and start over. Today was also the first day many business owners were able to return to their stores in downtown Fort Smith. I said, Mother, take cover, take cover. And I said, just a minute, Marcia, my God, the awning store, it's going. I want to go outside and see. Madeline Katsavis owns the Broadway restaurant. She says her father-in-law opened it in 1938, and although the inside is still in good shape, the strong winds destroyed the outside parking area. See that in the alleyway? Okay, that was over here. That was my, uh, the, the runway awning, and it was lifted up. I was looking at it, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's just devastating. Madeline was inside the restaurant and witnessed the destruction of the runway awning and this awning, which landed on her car. She estimates the storm did about $25,000 worth of damage. I called the insurance man right away. God love him. He was still asleep. But he came on down, and he looked at everything, and he said, go ahead and get everything worked out. I hope my insurance is real good. <laughs> That's the main thing. Harry Schwartz owns the hamburger barn and other businesses downtown. He estimates the damage as being around the seventy-five dollars to $100,000 mark. Right now, to solve the problem, we're going to build a wall right through there, right through the middle. This lady also owns a business, but it only suffered minor damage, so she spent the day helping other merchants. Trying to help everybody else out on this side, clean up all the glass for them. They were all busy with insurance people, so we thought we'd just kick the pitch in help them out. Building inspectors continue to assess the overall damage on Garrison. Officials say it's possible some of the structures may have to be demolished. Now, I'm standing live in downtown Garrison, down on Garrison Avenue, but we can't forget that the north side of town also took a severe beating. Now, countless numbers of people are homeless and without power. Now, as you can see, we're going to roll some video here. Utter devastation is the only way to describe the area. Homes are leveled, trees are uprooted, power lines are down. The Stevens Boys Club is one of the structures that took it hard on the chin, and it will be a while before that building is back in operation again. The damage is tremendous in the north side of town. Uh, around the, the North 23rd and High Street intersections and the North 6th Street areas. So again, it's going to be a while before these people get back on their feet. Bridget? Many Fort Smith residents are concerned about the tornado damage to the P Street sewer plant. The facility took a direct hit from the storm and it is no longer in use. Damage to the sewer plant is estimated in the millions. Well, the damage and cleanup is no less devastating for several Madison County families that were hit by the same storm Sunday night. The tornado touched down near St. Paul, obliterating everything in its path. 
A well-timed vacation may have saved the lives of a couple who lived in what used to be a house here. They were in Mexico and they don't know nothing about this yet. They're coming back tonight. Two others weren't so lucky. The storm's fury killed Tim Lackey and his 10-year-old son, Jesse, but spared Tim's wife, Leah. The family had lived in a trailer here for only two days before disaster struck Sunday night. Um, I can't imagine after just talking to him last Sunday and now he's gone. I just, I can't, I just, I can't come back, I don't think. The tornado ripped the trailer off its foundation with the family inside and carried it about 500 feet before the trailer crashed to the ground upside down. And they heard their son moaning and they crawled to him and she held him while he died. And then her and her husband were trying to search around to find anything to get under because it was hailing. She's got, she's got lumps on her head from the hail hitting her in the head. Leah and Tim were seriously injured and huddled in this car for shelter for eight hours before help reached them Monday morning. I think he died 15 minutes before the air, air vac got here for him. He tried to hold on and he said he didn't think he was going to make it and he didn't. Leah is still hospitalized in fair condition, so family members are sifting through the debris trying to find mementos of her former life. We're just trying to find anything that, that she can use to help put her life back together. Um, pictures, um, I, found her, I found her high school diploma over there. Federal emergency workers are expected to be on the scene sometime this week. But family members say Leah Lackey plans to put her life back together somewhere else. In Madison County, I'm Elizabeth Woolsey, TV5 News. There is a little bit of good news this morning. Garrison Avenue has been reopened to traffic. Commuters will no longer have to take the long way around to get to and from work. Slowly but surely, things are starting to get back to normal. Good afternoon. A second tragedy in three day days is unfolding in Fort Smith, downtown Fort Smith. You're looking at the Eads Brothers Furniture Store on Garrison Avenue at 414. Apparently, eyewitnesses say there was an explosion just a few moments ago, and now the entire building has gone up in flames. And I was, we were directly across the street. We weren't 100, 100 yards from the building. Okay, well, we're glad you're safe and sound. Everybody got out okay, I hope. Everybody was out. Everybody was just kind of scrambling around trying to uh, figure out what was going on, and then uh, we all decided the best thing we could do is get way back out of the way because it got so hot so quick that uh, it pretty obvious that you need to be three or four blocks back. Okay, Alan, thanks so much. Okay, uh, once Mark. again, downtown uh, Fort Smith is blocked off once again for the third time uh, since the tornado, or a second time since the tornado's hit. Bridget Bonds is standing by live at the scene. Let me tell you what's happened out here. About 2.30, we were coming out of a meeting from with FEMA in downtown Fort Smith about the tornado that happened Sunday. And all of a sudden, one of the downtown buildings was in flames. Now, it was the Eads Brothers building, and it went up so quickly, another building beside it also went up, and that is the Goodwill store. Now, I talked earlier to a man who was standing on top of the Eads building when it went up in flames. He was giving an estimate to the Eads Brothers building owner about his tornado damage when he saw smoke billowing out of the first floor. Both men did make it down safely through the fire escape. Now, at this time, those are the only two people that we know that were in or on the building. The man reassured me that there was no one inside the building because there was so much damage to it. Just three days after a devastating tornado, the Eads Brothers Furniture Store on Garrison Avenue has gone up in a ball of smoke and flames. The fire so intense that people across the street and down the way inside the buildings could feel the heat. Joining us now is a man uh, by phone who was on top of the building when, uh, well, not by phone, it's on tape. Uh, he was on top of the building when the, uh, the fire broke out after a series of small explosions. Oh, wow. Let's take that now. We went out a back window and down the fire escape. Okay, could, could I get you to, I have some trouble with my mic, could I get you to tell me that oh, again? Yeah. Um, Go ahead and just repeat, okay. tell me where you were and what happened. Well, we were, Bill Eads and myself were on the roof, uh, talking about the roof so I could give him an estimate on it. He, you know, the insurance adjuster and uh, structural engineer were going to meet us here. That's something else. And uh, we turned around and seen all the black smoke, and uh, 
you know, we just barely got to the first floor and it was full of smoke and went out a broken window and down the fire escape. And by then it was already, you know, in flames. I couldn't believe how fast it caught. You know, boy, it was just surprising how fast it went. Could you tell where the smoke was coming from? Somewhere in the front is all I know. Was there anyone else in the building? No, not that I know of. Just, I think it was, in fact, I know there wasn't because he had it locked and he had to unlock the door when we, you know, when we went to check the roof. Yeah. So it was probably electrical, I don't know. You were given even an estimate on his roof because of the yeah. tornado, Yes, right? uh-huh. Okay, and sir, you are in construction or what? Well, what? I was. My truck's in front of that building. Is that your truck in flames? Yeah. Wow. There it went. You were just listening to a taped interview with one of the two men that were was on top of the uh, Eads Brothers furniture when two, ex two or three explosions touched off a fire that has demolished the building. He was a contractor taking a look at the, the top of Eads Brothers furniture to come up with a price for repairing the uh, structure that had been damaged by the tornado Sunday night. And uh, the biggest question since Sunday, I guess, is uh, why didn't we hear sirens? Yeah, that's something that has bothered just every news organization, and Jay Hillgardner has been investigating that uh, in depth for the past, well, ever since the tornado struck, in fact. That's right. Uh, I've been doing a lot of calling around and on interviewing, and uh, I believe it was a matter of uh, the city of Fort Smith, frankly, putting all of its eggs basically in one basket, and that one basket was primarily two phone lines from the dispatcher's office in the Fort Smith Police Department to the Tulsa National Weather Service. That was basically their sole source of weather information to determine whether to hit the button, which is located in the dispatcher's office. That is the button to sound the uh, tornado sirens. Now, I spoke with Linda, Linda Arnold, who very graciously gave me uh, a moment of her very busy time. She is at the dispatcher's office, a very busy place. She's a communication supervisor for the Fort Smith Police Department. Is that the line that went down on Sunday night? Yes, sir. Uh, they apparently called, and when the dispatcher answered, there was only two or three words that uh, was said, and then the phone went dead. When you're here in the dispatcher's office, do you have any other sources of information for what's going on with the weather? No. Uh, the officers in the field, if we receive a, re a sighting from an officer, then we will activate the sirens from a direct sighting. Other than that, we wait for the National Weather Service to contact us and advise us of the situation, and then we react from that point. Okay, do you have a ham radio near here you can listen into spotters uh, reports? No, sir. Would, would you have time to listen to spotters reports? Uh, if we had one designated person, yes, sir. Okay, uh, if you had a person here in this in this room with a, with a ham radio, you, you would have the time for that? Yes. Okay, uh, do you have a weather, weather radio in this room? Uh, no, we don't. Do you have a television in this room? No, we don't. Do you have a radio in this room? No, sir. And do you have a weather wire teletype by any chance? Uh, no, sir. Okay. The only teletype we have is our ACIC. Okay. So just to reiterate, you basically are dependent on the line from here to the uh, Tulsa National Weather Service. And that's it, folks. Uh, they have two telephone lines, which went down uh, on Sunday night, and uh, that, was, that was their sole source of weather information. Oh, Jay, I'm confused. Everybody in Oklahoma knew uh, Arcoma, their uh, Arcoma, Oklahoma, their weather siren went off. Why were they so much better informed than we were on this side of the border? That's because most uh, offices, civil defense offices that handle severe weather situations have a variety of sources of weather information. To everything, there is a beginning and an end. We all know the end part of this story. A large tornado rips across the area, causing devastation and casualties. But what happened on Sunday afternoon before the tornadoes hit, before the sirens didn't sound, before the storms that carried the tornadoes even formed? For that answer, we have to go to the 18th floor of the federal building in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. The National Severe Storms Prediction Center is the place where severe weather watches are issued. Certainly uh, at least 48 hours prior to the event in uh, northwest Arkansas, uh, it looked like conditions would be favorable for severe storms. Uh, certainly didn't expect a tornado in any particular spot, but our outlooks did indicate the uh, high likelihood for severe weather. The center does not issue warnings for the storms that form. Instead, they issue the watches that defines the area that severe weather may develop in later. But after the watch box has been posted and the information passed along to the local National Weather Service offices, the job isn't over. 
And our responsibility stops with the issuance of watches. Of course, once a watch has been issued for a particular part of the state, we're always having to keep it maybe six hours or seven hours ahead of the event, hopefully, and extending the watches where necessary or issuing new watches if there's an area that's expected to develop uh, in the future separate from uh, existing activity. We do uh, monitor the watches, or the uh, warnings rather, that are issued by the local offices, but beyond that, no, we have no responsibility in the warnings. Some of the conditions that the Prediction Center monitors to define a watch area before the storm forms are proximity of a storm system to an area and the potential energy of that storm system to cause severe weather or tornadoes, the amount of moisture that the storm will need to produce heavy rainfall, and possible turbulence in an internal storm updrafts that may lead to producing large hail. When all these parameters come together in one area of the country, in the example of Sunday the 21st of April, the central Oklahoma area was issued a tornado watch around 3.30 p.m. And the strong storms that were produced that night, how likely were they to happen under those circumstances? Well, certainly not unprecedented, but uh, certainly uh, when we look back, say, in a period of a decade, you may get maybe three or four events of this nature. Uh, so certainly one of the more outstanding of events, but it isn't unprecedented. But uh, when this type of rapid air mass recovery, as we call it, a rapid surge of low-level moisture return, does occur, in association with the favorable wind profile that we had, that's usually a sign for a uh, you know, possibility of devastating uh, storms. This was a uh, Doppler depiction out of the Fort Worth radar. Here's Fort Worth, and of course Fort Smith is up in here. This was uh, just about an hour prior to the uh, tornado touchdown in Fort Smith on Sunday evening. And you can see the very strong storm, a supercell storm that had just gone through McAllister and was heading toward uh, Fort Smith at that time, and even though it's over 150 miles from the uh, uh, Fort Worth radar, it still uh, depicts uh, very strongly in the imagery here. Um, on the other side of the screen here, we show a vertical profile of the winds. These barbs move with the wind flow, and it, the uh, elevation, this is down near the ground, and the higher numbers are thousands of feet above the ground. You can see near the ground, winds were from the south, and then when the winds veered or turned to westerly, not very far off the ground. So that's an indication that there is a high likelihood for supercell development and then possible tornadoes. The local spotters watched the storm's approach. Uh, at that time, we was getting some reports from down that way. We was listening to another repeater that was further south down in around the McAllister area. I, I did that here uh, and, and was listening to some of their reports of what they were getting in uh, and someone was seeing some wall pads, and I think one, I don't, uh, one, once or twice they thought they seen a funnel developing in itself. If that's so, with funnel clouds and tornadoes from McAllister to Pecola, why only a severe thunderstorm warning for the Fort Smith area? What criteria does the National Weather Service use to issue a tornado warning? For tornado warning, we're looking at the uh, radar data on the WSR 88D. And we're able to look at velocity data, which shows uh, winds going towards the radar and also away from the radar. And we're looking for couplets of rotation in there. And if they're strong enough uh, to meet tornado warning criteria, then we issue a tornado warning. This is the radial velocity scan of Doppler radar, showing a possible tornado vortex near Schindler, Oklahoma. This is what the forecasters in Tulsa were looking at to determine if a tornado was forming southwest of the Fort Smith Van Buren area on Sunday, April 21st. Just before the tornado descended, the storm, according to National Weather Service officials, did not look like it was going to produce a tornado because there was no signature of a tornado present at the time. This despite the fact that there were multiple touchdowns earlier and several reports from local spotters and spotter groups was not enough to issue a tornado warning at 10.54. The obvious question, why not play it safe and issue a tornado warning anyway? This is simply a judgment, human factor kind of call. The radar showed it becoming disorganized. Given the same situation, the call could have went either way at that point. It's, it was one of those 50-50 kind of things. The same person, given the same situation two times in a row, might have done it differently. It's, it's just hard to say. The tornado warning was issued at 11.08 p.m., but by that time, electricity was off through much of the area and the phone line to Tulsa to the dispatcher's office had been cut. Meteorologist Jay Hillgartner picks up the story just outside of Fort Smith. 
After demolishing several barns, a home, and ripping the roof off of the Kilgore Slaughterhouse, a tornado lifts up east of Stigler, Oklahoma. As the funnel cloud drifts northeast towards Kerr Lake, Doppler weather radar in Tulsa picks up a second circulation further south, near Bacoshi, Oklahoma. At 10.45 p.m., a storm spotter reports a funnel cloud near Spiro drifting east. The order is given to turn on the tornado siren in Arcoma. The warnings for the Fort Smith area may be imminent, so again, if you are in the, t the Fort Smith area, you want to be thinking about where to go to should a tornado warning be issued. And again, we just stepped outside a little while ago. At 10.54, the National Weather Service in Tulsa issues a severe thunderstorm warning for the Fort Smith area. Near Arcoma, a funnel cloud which had been heading more easterly towards the Fort Smith airport turns north. In the darkness, shortly after 11 p.m., behind the rain and hail, a funnel cloud drifts over State Line Road and Wheeler in Fort Smith. It touches down briefly and lifts up again, depositing a 60 by 30 foot section of roof onto a house at 10th and J in South Fort Smith. At 11.08, a tornado warning is issued for the Fort Smith area, but the phone line has been cut. With that as their only source of weather information, the tornado siren button in the dispatcher's office is never pushed. The funnel cloud passes over the Civic Center, the Holiday Inn, and Judge Parker's courthouse. People in nearby Muldrow, Oklahoma, take cover. Yes, ma'am, cover your child up with your staff. Keep your hands down. Around 11.13 p.m., TV5 photographer John Popa catches the funnel descending onto Garrison Avenue. <laughs> Attorney Jim Robb was near the top of the 200 Garrison building. I was in the office late, and uh, without any advance warning other than just the lights going out, uh, I quickly ducked under the desk, and the next thing I knew, in about two seconds, the uh, entire area was covered with debris, uh, and I was encased underneath the desk, and I uh, managed to dig out, and, like any attorney would, use my mouth to yell for help. <laughs> From the Garrison Avenue bridge to the 500 block in the historic downtown area, the sky explodes in a shower of bricks, glass, and debris. Roofs are peeled off some buildings, while entire floors are sheared from others. As the twister roars into the industrial and residential areas of North Fort Smith, it's about a quarter of a mile wide. On North 4th Street, two 48-foot trailers full of grain are lifted and demolished. The roof flies off Miss Lara's. Border City food buildings are shredded. Sparks fly from the OG&E substation at 3rd and B. The west side of the twister parallels Clayton Expressway, where it destroys the P Street wastewater treatment plant. The east side of the storm tears through homes along and west of 6th Street. Uh, the thunder and the lightning, I heard it, and then all of a sudden it got real still and it sounded like a train. And I got out of, run out of bed, run in there in my kid's room, and got my nephew and my son. And then I run through them in the bathtub, and I laid over on top of them, and then the wall started bowing and the tub started, and I knew we'd been hit hard. I just didn't know how bad. On North 23rd, five-year-old Kyle Johnson is thrown out of his house and killed. The tornado moves relentlessly on. The man got a hold of the hot water tank, and they thought he said that was the heaviest thing in the house. He told his wife and daughter, and he got a hold of the hot water tank, and they got a hold of him, and the house is completely blown away. Uh, it's all gone, and when it was over, over with, he still had a hold of the hot water tank, and they had a hold of him. I just I landed on top of my wife and little girl, and. And I tried to, you know, I said, if it takes anybody, take me, not my wife or kid. Only a few minutes have passed since it first touched down on Garrison Avenue. Ahead, in the tornado's path, Van Buren. The tornado was three quarters of a mile wide by the time it crossed the Arkansas River from Fort Smith and slammed into the Vista Hill section of Van Buren. We were in the hall. So the electricity went off. We'd gone to get a flashlight. My wife sat down in the hall. And by the time I got back and sat down with her, uh, the windows blew out. Uh, the next thing we remember is just glass flying everywhere. We grabbed each other and rolled around for a while. And in about 30 seconds or so, it was just all gone. The walls were gone. The tornado tore down the mountainside, tearing off roofs and tossing cars like toys. Within minutes, from Skyline Drive to Pointer Trail, hundreds of homes were destroyed or heavily damaged. In the eerie silence and darkness, punctuated with brilliant flashes of lightning, photographer Tony Odo videotaped the funnel as it passed close by overhead. Meanwhile, word spread quickly among police patrols that something was very wrong in Van Buren.
The twister crossed I-40 near the intersection with Highway 59, tossing tractor-trailer trucks off the road. On the other side, it plowed into the new subdivisions along Rena Road. With the electricity gone and no TV or radio, and with no tornado sirens nearby to warn them, more than a few residents responded to a sense of approaching danger. You could hear the hail hitting the glass panes on the windows, and the electricity kept going off and on, off and on, and it finally went off, and I woke up my husband and I said, I can't hear Taylor's room. The monitor's gone off because the electricity's off. And he said, it has, and I said, yeah, and he got up and opened the front door, and about the time he opened the front door, it was dead silence. It had been so loud before that with all the thunder and lightning and the hail hitting the windows, and it was, it was dead silence. You couldn't hear a thing. And my first thought was, it's oh, and I told him that. I said, it's always silent before a tornado hits. I said, go grab your daughter now. And that's when I jumped up out of bed, and he came and grabbed her. And like I said, within maybe 10 seconds of him grabbing her, that's when the tornado hit the house. Wife looked out the window and just got really scared, just got a gut feeling that she, we needed to get tucked away. We didn't even know the storm was heading toward us, but it didn't look right outside. So we hopped in, a, we have a fourth bedroom, a little middle room that there's no windows on it. So we got in there with some pillows and blankets, covered our heads up and got the animals in there. And uh, started hearing a rumbling come down the, down over the mountain there, I guess. And uh, I thought it just blew a uh, part of the, I thought it blew the windows in is what I thought. And the sheetrock stayed above us, opened the door up and everything was gone. <laughs> Within a minute's time, brand new subdivisions were reduced to rubble. Around 11.21, the tornado left Van Buren, destroying more houses between Figure 5 and Rudy. It had taken it only eight minutes to go from downtown Fort Smith. The tornado funnel touched down again through the community of Fern in western Franklin County, doing extensive damage. Continuing on up into the Boston Mountains, the tornado tore down a mountain and up the other side, damaging or destroying 2,000 acres of forest. South of St. Paul, near Highway 23 in Madison County, a tornado struck the trailer home of Jesse and Leah Lackey. The trailer flew 500 feet before it crashed to the ground in a tangle of trees, furniture, and metal, killing Jesse Lackey and their son, Tim. The tornado had claimed its third and fourth victims, and it was still not finished. Southeast of Aurora, a tornado struck Shannon and Leo Keck's home on Venus Mountain. Fortunately, they survived, but their house did not. For one last time, the tornado lifted back into the sky. From Haskell County in Oklahoma to Madison County, Arkansas, a tornado or series of tornadoes spawned from a supercell thunderstorm had carved a sporadic, deadly path up to a mile wide and 130 miles long. In its wake, four had died, 50 were injured, and several communities lay in shambles. All right, that's right. Thank God you're alive, darling. That's right. It would be a long night of neighbors digging neighbors out of rubble, of shock and confusion, and with the power gone, impenetrable darkness along with the pouring rain. As local schools were converted into makeshift hospitals, emergency crews assessed the damage. By dawn, we were amazed. That two died in Fort Smith is too, too many. But considering the scope of the damage, it's incredible that more people weren't killed or injured by this terrible storm. Chalk it up to luck or the grace of God. For more than a few, their survival that night was miraculous. But the people affected had a great storm sense as well. They knew where to go when the tornado hit. Mark McFarland, his wife and little girl, rode out the tornado in their bathroom, the only room left intact. You know, through the years, like I said, that's, you know, I've always heard that's where to go, in the center of your house and in the smallest room. You know, and I, I was going to stuff them in one of these closets if I could have. <laughs> With debris and glass shattering around them, the Gaines family also took shelter in their bathroom. I had just remembered that in, in an event of a tornado, you needed to be on the most interior wall of the house. Dina Baker and her husband fled to the bathroom and jumped in the bathtub, which made for a very effective tornado shelter. He said, get in the tub. So I got in the tub, and we, we had a little mattress we put over us, and he sat right there beside us, and then a little bit of us over, but I really thought we might go. Linda Hensley's grandmother made it through by going to her hallway in the middle of the house. So do we end up, two, these are two walls, interior mm -hmm. walls, and the only thing left standing, right. basically. The only thing that had a roof over it. So. Yeah. Yeah. The Olnicks went into a small middle room while their more spacious living room was torn to pieces. How did you know to go to a middle room? Just growing up listening to what people say, get away from windows and get toward the center of the house and things like that so the walls don't cr crumble in on you. And you all were basically uninjured? Oh, not a scratch. Not a scratch on us. I've got more scratches and stuff picking up stuff than I did from the storm. If the tornado had struck during the day, the fatalities may have been greater. 
Many people might have tried to escape the twister in their cars rather than going indoors or leaving their cars and seeking shelter in a low-lying area or under a bridge. But the fact that so many survived was more than just luck. Many people saved themselves with quick thinking and doing exactly what they're supposed to do when a tornado approaches. They went to a small middle room on the bottom floor of their house. They didn't waste time or put themselves in the path of flying debris trying to open windows. And they heeded their sense of impending danger. What about the future? Well, we can protect ourselves by knowing, as these folks did, what to do when a tornado approaches. We can also build better houses. For those who've lost their roof and are having their home rebuilt, or for those who are building a new home, demand that the builder install hurricane clips. As with this tornado-damaged house in Van Buren, most builders put only two or three nails at the end of each rafter. This conforms to area building codes. Hurricane clips, however, enable the builder to place up to a dozen nails at each end. Studies have shown that hurricane clips, which cost very little to add, enormously strengthen the ability of a roof to withstand high winds. And if you can save the roof, you can often spare the house. If you're building from the ground up, demand that the builder secure the walls to the foundation with anchor bolts. These can prevent your house from literally flying away in high winds. With winds estimated up to 200 miles per hour, much of the damage in the center of the storm's path would have been unavoidable anyway. But we can strengthen our homes to withstand less powerful winds. If our standards for rebuilding homes here in Tornado Alley can be brought up to the same level of common sense that people displayed when facing this twister, we can be even more prepared the next time a tornado strikes. For a while there, it seemed like disaster had pulled up a chair and decided to stay. On Wednesday, a raging fire erupted in the tornado-damaged E's Brother Furniture Building, destroying five businesses along Garrison Avenue. The fire completed what the tornado had started. How to rebuild downtown Fort Smith will be a concern for a long time to come. Folks in the tornado-ravaged areas of west and northwest Arkansas, however, are still mostly wondering how to rebuild their homes and their lives. I still have my family. That's really all that matters to me is that I have my family and I have people that that I loved. I, I'm from Van Buren and this is people I love. Just, you know, hearing them say, my house is gone, but I'm still alive. That meant more than any possession that I could ever have. The twister was hardest on those who lost loved ones. Leah Lackey's husband and son were killed by the storm. I know I'll never forget it. Um, I don't want to forget my last moments with my family, but I do want to get to a point where, you know, I have to be able to go on someday. And everything happens for a reason. Everything. God can turn anything into something good. The Twister was the most expensive to hit Northwest Arkansas. In Sebastian, Crawford, Franklin, and Madison counties, it damaged or destroyed some 2,400 homes and 100 businesses. The estimated cost, over half a billion dollars. Six counties in West and Northwest Arkansas were declared disaster areas. The National Guard is still here watching for those who prey on such disasters. Passes are still needed for getting into many tornado ravaged areas. Hello, hi. hi. I'm Lieutenant McFarland with the Salvation Army. How you doing? Uh Almost two weeks after the storm, the Salvation Army, the American Red Cross, and other United Way agencies are still running shelters and kitchens, distributing food, and otherwise taking care of the storm's victims. The Sebastian County Humane Society and local citizens continue to provide relief to many a pet and worried pet owner affected by the storm. Last week, a federal disaster survey team came to town to assess the performance of the Weather Service office in Tulsa and the communication of storm warnings between Tulsa and the Fort Smith area during the tornado. They're supposed to issue preliminary findings by early June. Though the Tulsa office did an excellent job tracking the storm up to Fort Smith, their hesitancy in issuing a tornado warning for Fort Smith and Van Buren has lost them some public confidence, a confidence which they'll have to work to get back. The disaster, it seems, did speed up the acquisition of a Doppler radar to be placed closer to Fort Smith and to cover a blind spot in southeast Oklahoma and southwest Arkansas. The area your storms come from, which is generally from the southwest, this new radar will provide additional coverage in that area, which will, I think, uh, allow us to issue much better warnings because it's going to be a little bit closer to the radar, but secondly, it's going to get your approach area which is something which where the coverage is, is deficient now. 
the Doppler weather radar, originally headed for the Caribbean, could be installed in an as yet undetermined location in the Washita's by as early as next spring. It does appear there will be major changes in how Fort Smith determines when to turn on the tornado sirens. When another severe weather outbreak occurred a week after the tornado, this time there was a ham radio and a weather net operator near the dispatcher's office where the tornado siren button is located. City officials are meeting with local storm spotters and more changes in Fort Smith's civil defense system are promised. And the cleanup continues. Almost two weeks after the storm, the sound of buzz saws and the rumbling of dump trucks still permeates the air. This is 39 years of our life right here. And my husband told me this morning about 3.30, he says, well, we're going to start over just like when we were first married. I just hope we don't argue as much as we did then. <laughs> you have to laugh a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's been an awareness of, of what can happen. One day you can have everything, the next day you don't, and how do we need to pull together even more. Disaster did come to northwest Arkansas, but it seems it couldn't find a home in the hearts, faith, and spirit of her people. That's why we want to leave you tonight with a sign of hope, looking at trees as they were meant to be, tall and proud and upright, particularly this tree, the dogwood. It is the symbol of rebirth and resurrection, and despite the tornado, the straight line winds, the intensity of Sunday's storm, the dogwood flower still blooms as it clings stubbornly to the dogwood tree. Good night. <laughs>